Welcome to Destination Virginia. Get ready, we're going back in time. Great, you warm up the DeLorean, I'll get the flux capacitor. <laughs> Karen, wait, wait, Karen, stay tuned. Destination Virginia. We're here at Jamestown Settlement in historic Williamsburg, Virginia. Hey, isn't that where Pocahontas met John Smith? I think there's a little bit more to it than that. <laughs> Coming up, we'll visit a traditional Powhatan village and a colonial English settlement. And we'll learn about the tenacity of the women who settled here. Get ready, we're going to walk back in time. Jamestown Yorktown Foundation operates two living history museums here in America's historic triangle, Jamestown Settlement and the American Revolution Museum at Yorktown. We're about 23 miles apart from one another, but we kind of cover the bookends of the colonial period. Where it started for the British in America here at Jamestown in May of 1607, and where it ended for the British in America at Yorktown in 1781 in the fall. Our guests come from all over the country and they're kind of confused sometimes as to the order of how things were. I'd say most of them are familiar with Plymouth and the Mayflower and those pilgrims that settled up there in 1620. You know, that's an important story at Plymouth. Uh, it's important that the story's told in the right order though. For that's chapter two. Chapter one of our nation's history begins at Jamestown in May of 1607. We believe in hands-on history. Uh, if you can try something out, try something on, lend a hand, you're gonna understand that history and you're gonna remember it for a long time as well. So we have traditional museum galleries with 400 year old plus artifacts under glass cases, wonderful films and interactive things inside. But when you step outdoors into our living history environment, whether it's our Powhatan Village, aboard Susan Constant, Godspeed of Discovery, Virginia's founding fleet, or here in the recreated James Fort, we try to bring Virginia's history to life. You're gonna experience the sights, the sounds, and the smells of the 17th century. You'll hear the hammers clanging away from the blacksmith. You'll hear muskets firing periodically here in the fort. You'll hear artillery firing on the ships from time to time. We clean out the chicken coops, so you'll get those smells. You might be helping us collect eggs that day. You know, you might be helping us mix ingredients because we're cooking 17th century recipes that day. You might be helping to plant seeds and turn the soil over for the crops that we're gonna be planting or perhaps we're harvesting. There's an array of stuff to be done and we like to get people involved and right in the middle of it with us. All the 400 year old stuff is inside, protected. So out here, you can touch and handle things just about all you want. We keep charge of the sharp things so no one gets themselves injured but it's a fun way to learn history. I like to call these our outdoor classrooms here. We don't have computers, we don't have textbooks, but we have things from the 17th century that really, really work, and we like folks to get out here and explore and try things out. No matter how you like to learn history, whether you like to look at artifacts behind glass, or whether you like to come out into a living history environment and try things out and try things on, we've got that here for you. So come to Jamestown Settlement and soak up some history. So there are many things to explore here at Jamestown Settlement. Only one of them takes place inside, and that's happening in the gallery behind me. It's called Tenacity, and to tell us more, here's Pam. How are Hi. you, Pam? Very well. Thank you so much for coming today. Tenacity is the story of women in Jamestown and early Virginia. Most people who think about Jamestown think about people like John Smith, um, the men of Jamestown. Yes. But this exhibit takes a different look and we feature a number of women that we've researched through time to tell the story of Jamestown from a different perspective. One of the pieces that we feature in the exhibit is a ducking chair. Oh, that's the thing you're going to show how it works. <laughs> how long is she gonna go on? You're, you're, you're gonna, a while gonna now. try that, eh? How, how long will she be under? I just wanna start thinking. Well, are you uh, a Could brabbler? 
A what? A brabbler. She could be. <laughs> you people talk call about me a lot of things. <laughs> you talk about people behind their backs. Just him. So then you qualify. Uh, apparently, yes. <laughs> Women would be charged with brabbling, which meant that they were malicious gossiping or or slandering someone, um, talking about them behind their backs and, and destroying their reputations. Um, and then they could be put into a ducking chair. And we have a number of cases uh, in which women, it's happened to women, um, and one documented case of a woman being put in the chair, and when you see it, your arms are, um, you're, 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 strapped you're, in. you're strapped in, and they're metal, it's metal straps. Um, and then they would duck you in the water for 30 seconds, bring you back up, do it again, bring you back up, and we have one, one case where you know, the woman was ducked five times, so, you know, that's, um, but it wasn't like a, it wasn't but a it's death real, thing. It wasn't a death okay. thing, but um, it was pretty, wow. pretty horrendous. Kim, thank you so much for spending Absolutely. time with us. Absolutely, it's a pleasure. Wow, there is so much to see and learn about inside this beautiful museum, and there's even more on the outside. When we come back, we'll visit the Living History Museum at Jamestown Settlement. Stay tuned. Welcome back to Destination Virginia. We're at Jamestown Settlement, a living history museum, and we're smack dab in the middle of a traditional recreated Powhatan village. And we're gonna learn what life was like from cooking to hunting to building a home. So here at Jamestown Settlement, when you first leave behind our indoor museum galleries and come into our li recreated living history areas, your first stop along the way is with our Powhatan Indian Village, where you learn about the Powhatan people. And here this morning is Martin, who's uh, waiting on us and going to introduce you to our Powhatan Indian Village. Come on in. Fantastic. Come on, guys. Thanks, Howard. Thank you. What are we looking at here, specifically? Our museum is recreating how Powhatan people are living at the point of English arrival. Between the cooking, the tools, the clothing, the paint, the tattooing, that's all how they describe Powhatan people looking 400 years ago. And so what we've got cooking here are a couple different things. We've got a turkey that we butchered out here on site. Delicious. Cooking over the spit, yeah. He's, he's the slowest turkey, obviously. <laughs> well, yeah, he was. <laughs> and then in the Sad. pot there, we've got uh, venison. We have hominy, which is a way of prepping corn. We've also got dried cherries and blueberries. You can use that wow. scoop to pick up a little bit of it and see oh, what this? it looks like. Okay. Wow. It's a little smoky. Look at yeah, that. it is a little smoky. It's something you get used to out here. I can tell. It's like, I can see the hominy in there. And is that rice? Oh. Yeah, wild rice that would be in the rivers here. Now, if you were looking for something that's going to have a little bit of sweetness to it, the English talk about dainties that are made with cornbread or cornmeal that has fruit mixed into it. Dainties. Is that is that? Yeah, those? these here. Uh. So these ones are cooked right on the hot stones, but that isn't the only way in which they can be made. Sometimes they're made in dumplings, they're rolled into balls and put into the soups, or they make them even like tamales, wrapping them in corn husks and then boiling them. Oh, so is that what he's That's what he's around? doing. Do you, wanna, do you wanna make one? I would love to make All right. one. Yeah, Russell yeah. will be give the you a hand. What do I do with this? Well, you can hand it to me. <laughs> That's a loaded question. All right, <laughs> safety first. So how much, just, just dig? Really, just a palm-sized piece is what you're after. So. Just kind of like that, or yeah, any shape in particular? Pretty commonly, just gonna roll it into sort of little patty or cookie okay. shape you might think of. And I have a packet of soy sauce. Right if you need it. A packet of soy sauce. <laughs> now watch it; those stones are gonna be okay. hot. So I just kind of drop it. Yep, you're just gonna drop set it like it a pack. Yep. Wow. You can see as they spend a little bit of time next to the fire, you may twist them around, or you may actually gather the coals simply around the base. And so oh. the English accounts mention the women preparing. Uh, corn into a bread or pieces like this very neatly on flat stones in and around the fire to bake. Wow, look at this. Hi, Jamie. Hi. Thank, Hi. You, thank you so much for letting us 
crash your house party. You're very welcome. Thank you for coming. It's so warm in here. I turned the heater up just for you. This would be nice and toasty. It's very comfortable. I appreciate it. Great. That. And I know if I say, talk to me about your hut, you would say, no, it's not a hut there. Exactly, yeah. A hut's kind of a word that um, gives the impression that it's a temporary structure, something that you'd put up real quick and, and be able to take down. But this structure is actually a permanent home, and the, the Powhatan's permanent word for a permanent home is yehaken. Yehaken, say it together, can't read. Yehaken. Yehaken, yeah. And that just translates to either house or home. And the Powhatan would have one family living in here, so they're going to kind of build it just like we would buy a house today. We're going to buy it suited for what size family we have, maybe how much money we make. The, the Yehakens would be the same way. Now, why is it, it like at this level here around the fire, it's not smoky at all, but standing up? The houses are kind of designed to have a layer of smoke, so you can kind of see how all of their smoke is layered at about head level and up. And part of the reason is because of the climate we have here in Virginia. As you know, it's very humid, yes. and everything gets very moldy in the summertime. So the, the smoke helps to keep everything in here from getting moldy. It also helps to keep the mosquitoes out of the house. So they want to keep some smoke in the house. They just don't want to have it down low where they are. So they build low beds, or sometimes even might put furs like this on the floor and sleep on the floor. And that way, they're always out of the smoke layer. So what are all these things hanging? Just the typical things a family would need to live. The family structure is usually that the moms are the ones who own the house. They're the ones who are here in the village all the time. It's a matrilineal society, so your family status passes down through the mother's line. They were very smart, Mary. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. And um, so she's the one who takes care of the house. So she would have implements in here for taking care of the house, for taking care of the children. The women are also the farmers, so they bring in about half of the food through farming. So they do all the hard work, basically. They do a lot of the hard work, but they also get all the benefits from it since they do own everything. Oh, wow, that's nice. You can hear the excitement of the kids outside. You can, you can. They definitely get very excited when they get here. I mean, this really brings history to life for them. I mean, where else can you go to experience what a, a Powhatan village would have been like 400 years ago? Jamie, thank you so much for letting us stop by. You're Unannounced. Welcome. You're welcome. <laughs> this has been great. Thank you. So, Barry, do you think you're ready to hunt us up a turkey and make us some lunch? We may go hungry. <laughs> you're probably when, right. <laughs> when Destination Virginia returns, we'll leave our Indian village and head over to an English settlement. We'll find out how they got here and how they lived. Let's go. Our next stop, after you leave our Powhatan village and our living history sites, is here at Virginia's Founding Fleet. You're on board Discovery right now, and this is one of our sailors, Don, here today to tell you a little bit about uh, this journey to Virginia in 1607. Don, how are you? I'm absolutely wonderful, and you? What, what is your, I want to make sure I have this right, what is your title, your correct official Jamestown settlement title? Costumed Historical Interpreter. I was going to say that. So where are we? <laughs> okay, this is Discovery. This is the smallest of our three ships. Susan Constant is the largest. Godspeed's the middle size, and, and this is Discovery. The first fleet to bring the English to Virginia. John Smith and all of those guys are in this fleet, arriving here in May of 1607. So are these actual size? As far as we can tell, yes. They're not big ships, but you don't want necessarily large ships for the first voyage. Uh, it would be really embarrassing to have a ship that needs 18 feet of water and come over here and find out you only have 12. I don't see a lot of technology on this, board here. How do this, you know where you're going? This is the latest and greatest in maritime technology for 1607. And we're gonna use a compass. Now, this is a mariner's compass. Uh, it's also called a box compass because, well, it's a box uh, for protection and to put these gimbals, these brass rings. Compass reads best if it's parallel to the surface. Ships are not always, very rarely, parallel. They move. So when the ship moves, the compass remains so we've got an, a device called a chip log that's used to figure out speed. I don't know about y'all, but I'm not going to be able to remember all of those numbers over a three or four hour period. It's not happening. Mm -hmm. So we have a navigational aid, a memory aid. Uh, 
Uh-huh. For the 60 and over. The cheat sheet. Yeah, well, yeah. <laughs> like this, is called, this is called a Travers board. <laughs> now, that is the compass rose. Same as that. Okay. Okay. Eight holes in each compass point. Okay. Every half hour, you're going to look at your compass. Mm -hmm. You're going to find out what direction, figure out what direction you're going. And we're going to make it easy. We're going to go north for the first half hour. And we're going to go north for the second half hour. And it's going to be a long, boring watch. We're going to go north for the entire four hour watch. There's direction and time. What are we missing? Speed. All right, pick a number between one and 10. Seven. Seven. Oh, I was going to say seven. Seven. Yeah. Okay. So, eight rows of holes again each half hour. All right. So, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. And like I said, long, boring. I like boring watches. <laughs> okay. So we went seven nautical miles per hour for four hours. So we went 28 nautical miles in a northerly direction. Start here, you put it on the chart, you're here, you go north 28 miles, put a mark on the chart, that's where you are now. And you do this every four hours. It's a navigational um, system uh, called Dead Reckoning. So we have been smelling these wonderful mm. smells, and I'm so excited to know this is where they're coming from. It is. We are making a 17th century pork sausage recipe mm. uh, from a book that was written by a guy back in the latest part of the 16th century. Here, by the way, is, uh, is one of our little cookbooks, basically. The first part, we're taking pieces of pork, we're slicing them up. Most people don't have something like this. It's oh, like wow. a cleaver. Yeah. This is my mincing knife. I've been using this one to cut the meat fairly fine and get some pork uh, leaf fat in there. This is the one that's really the fun part. Uh, where you... Modern pork sausage has the texture like hamburger, if you've noticed. Mm -hmm. This is got a finer, more minced texture. Uh, what he's doing, he's mixing, using a mortar and pestle, he's mixing our final sausage mixture. He's also, this is when he's adding the spices. Come on over and uh, give it a try. Sure. Use your muscles. All right. <laughs> this is heavy. <laughs> now you always, like I've seen oh. in all the cooking shows, you always have to have the finished product. So here we go, I'm gonna hold it oh, over here. We that. can get a little better light on it. Yep. Um, there is our finished product. And there you go. Oh, that smells really good. That's one of the big advantages of being staff or volunteers here. Not only do we experiment with 17th century food, but we have to evaluate the results. And that's such a hard <laughs> job. <That's laughs> right. Your cooking demonstrations, is, is there a specific schedule if people wanted to come in and see that? We cook fairly frequently here. And every now and then, we'll be doing something that isn't cooking. Like, for instance, today, while we might have been cooking a little sausage, we're mostly preparing meat. So sometimes we've even been uh, salting down hams in here, making bacon. We even sometimes do a special uh, educational program in which kids come in and we teach them how to make a thing called a corn cake. It's not very exciting unless you're a kid and you're cooking corn batter cakes in hot lard. That yourself, that you made yourself. <laughs> well, okay, we don't let the kids play with the hot lard, but we <laughs> let them okay. make the uh, the corn cakes and then they watch as they cook it. And they actually get a chance to nibble a bit and get a taste of the 17th century. Wonderful. Wonderful. Shannon, how does she do with the... Uh... Oh, she did great. It's, um, it's ready to go. All right, we have a couple of people in the drive-thru, so we want to get this going here. Oh, yeah. all right. <laughs> <laughs> Wonderful learning about all of this. Now, I want to go see what all that banging's about. All right. <laughs> Meanwhile, we'll see if we can't make more noise over here. Bye. Hey, hey, there we go. <laughs> Now for our demonstrations today, rather than carrying powder in the chargers and priming flasks as they would have done, we are now using paper cartridges. Same measured amount of gunpowder, just a little bit different container. Loading process, it's going to work the same way with a little bit of powder in the pan. 
rest of the powder down the barrel. I will not be using a musket ball today since obviously a bullet in the middle of a museum would be a little hazardous. Uh, but that's one of the advantages for us using that paper cartridge is the empty paper gives me something to ram in on top of the powder instead of the musket ball to keep everything compacted down at the breech. With the match set, the weapon is now ready to fire. And again, if you don't care for loud noises, you may wish to cover your ears. Present your piece! So we talked about experiencing the sights, the sounds, and the smells of the 17th century here at Jamestown yeah. Settlement. Perfect way to do that here with Brian and his musket and all of his gear. So you're in good hands. Come up close, see what he's doing. Ooh, great. Good afternoon. Good you know you're on fire. Yes, in fact. <laughs> okay, I just want to get that out of the way. Yeah, with the matchlock musket, which is going to be the, the weapon that they, the colonists primarily rely on for security here, uh, without that burning cord, there really isn't any way to set the weapon off. Mm -hmm. And just about every firearm invented after the matchlock creates its own fire, but this weapon does not. So colonists on guard duty or in combat are going to be carrying that burning rope. How long will that rope last? Both ends lit will burn about a foot an hour. Um, so this oh. one we're coming to the end of, but you might start with as much as six feet of it, um, so that you've got some time to work with. Okay. How heavy is that? Uh, this weapon's about 14 pounds. They range quite a bit in the time period. If you'd like, let's check it out. Just bear in Go mind, ahead. this lever okay, here is the ball. trigger, right. so uh, avoid pulling that. Okay. And right under there, and we'll just keep it pointed in that direction. Here's and don't point, it. don't point at me, please. <laughs> Oh my gosh, that is kind of so. See, so, takes a little getting so used to. So where would you like? This goes up against my. Leg. Right, and you want to move your hand forward until your thumb is in the groove there. Oh, there that, you that's go. That's natural. <laughs> uh, it takes a little getting used to. Once you're used to it, it's actually a surprisingly <laughs> comfortable weapon to fire. <laughs> surprisingly, surprisingly comfortable. comfortable. <laughs> Just like a mattress. Do you see well, my bear, arm shaking? <laughs> bear in mind, you know, if you don't feel comfortable with it yet, your sergeant will make sure you get used to it. And I have a month. That's right. Typic so they, typically, they figured a few weeks to a month is going to be uh, sufficient to make just about anybody proficient. Not to work up your muscles just to hold this. <laughs> certainly, certainly. Yeah, that would Shaking. be a part of it. And so, the board has been So overtaken. you're scared, you're being attacked, and you're holding this massive thing. <laughs> now, wow. bear in mind, That's with a. Uh, and no bullet. Bear in mind, with a projectile this large, if you had a lighter firearm, it's going to kick really hard. Oh. It's that so first that first roll of physics, would. right? For every action, mm -hmm. equal and opposite yeah. reaction. Uh, so uh, the heavier weapon is is not going to uh, not going to kick as hard. Uh, now talking about weight, of course, you're looking at you know everything a soldier has to carry throughout history. Soldiers have had to carry a lot of stuff. The soldiers here at Jamestown, of course, armor is going to be a very important component, and we've got armor around the fort just for trying on. If you'd like to give it a try. Well, I want to go see you in helmet. Okay, Shall I'm we? ready. That's good. Thank, Thank you, Brian. Very much. Sure thing. It's my pleasure. Right. Thanks for coming out to see us today. Well, Homer, we've had so much fun here today at Jamestown Settlement. I gotta tell you, I learned a whole lot. Well, that's what it's all about. We want folks to come and learn a lot about Virginia's history, but we want everyone to have fun at the same time and put the two together. Well, we did have a great time, thank you. Oh, you're very welcome. Come back and see us again and travel safe, okay? Thank <laughs> we you. sure will. Whether you are looking for an incredible educational experience or just want to have a fantastic time with your family, you've got to come check out Jamestown Settlement. And if you'd like to be featured on an upcoming episode of Destination Virginia, please get in touch with us. And don't forget to make Virginia your next destination. What do you think about that? Wow, there are so many amazing things to see and learn about inside this beautiful museum. And there's even more on the outside. When we come back, we'll visit the Living History Museum at Jamestown Settlement. Stay stew, stewed. <laughs> stewed. <laughs> Stay stewed. Stew. What's a stew? Been, we, I, we, mulligan stew? We've checked out the bar, and we're ready to go. <laughs> All right. He's stewed. See stewed. <laughs> And we'll learn about the tenacity of the women who settled here. So get ready. We're, we're, so get ready. We're, we're going to walk back in time. We're walking back.